Hello and welcome to Writers and Books Visiting Author Series. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages and backgrounds. You can find more information at our website, wab.org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free, feel free to submit questions to the chat or Q&A function. Books are available through our bookstore ampersand books. I'll put the link in the chat. We're so happy to have Tyler Barton with us this evening. First, we'll hear him read, then he'll be in conversation with Kevin Wilson. Kevin Wilson is the author of five books, most recently, Nothing to See Here. His fiction has appeared in the Penn O. Henry Prize Stories 2012, Best American Short Stories 2020 and 2021, and the Pushcart Prize 46, among others. He lives in Sewanee, Tennessee, where he teaches at the University of the South. Loss and rediscovery occupy the heart of Tyler Barton's debut collection, Eternal Night at the Nature Museum. In 20 vivid, rowdy, buoyant stories, ranging from one-page flashes to 30-page odysseys, Barton assembles a collection of unforgettable safe havens. Tyler Barton is the author of The Quiet Part Loud, winner of the Turnbuckle Chapbook Contest from Split Lift Press. His short fiction has been published widely in such journals and magazines as Kenyon Review, Electric Literature, The Iowa Review, Gulf Coast, Cincinnati Review, Copper Nickel, and others. He is the communications manager for the Adirondack Center for Writing and lives in Saranac Lake, New York. Tyler, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Dan. This is uh, really special and I'm so excited to do it. And thanks for everyone for coming and thanks to Kevin for doing this. Um, yeah, I'm just really excited to get to celebrate the book like this. So I'm going to read a piece that I haven't read. I don't know if I've ever read for an audience before, but uh, I've been thinking a lot recently about literary community. It's always been incredibly important to me and it's been really tough in the last two years and has made me um, have to grapple with a lot, but um, I still really believe in it. And even things like this are, are helping to keep us together. And I appreciate that. So I wanted to read a story that is kind of about community. And um, it is called Miss Bodislav's Vomit. Um, it's a little vulgar at, at times, but I hope it's fun. So this is Miss Bodislav's Vomit, a short story from uh, my book, Eternal Night at the Nature Museum. Our church had a drive through window. It was meant for those who couldn't make the service, who couldn't take another night like the one they'd had before. Those disgruntled and hungry few who, wishing the squat blue building was still a Hardee's, drove through just to air their grievances. The window, its glass permanently stained with bird shit, was open all weekend long. And one Sunday morning, beneath that open window, we found Pastor Christine hogtied asleep on the floor, our donation box gone. The pastor was fine physically and insisted on delivering her sermon that Sunday anyway, the sermon in which she declared that if you're looking for God, even in the ski masked face of an attacker, you will see God. She had two reasons she believed this. She told the attacker she'd pray for him and he'd thanked her. And she spoke of the robins that had flown in during the early morning hours and started a nest in the old soda fountain behind our altar. The birds had even used our church merch, threads from our cotton tees, bits of our now as a gift, that's why they call it the present bumper stickers in the weaving of their home. No one asked for evidence to back these crazy claims because when Pastor Christine got on a roll, reality itself seemed to hover just above the ground. We went with it. These creatures came to us, she preached. We made a sanctuary. It was a tough sell convincing us the burglary was a feature, not a bug, of our new community outreach project, the drive through prayer. There were comments from the audience. Listen, Chris, can we close the damn drive through already? Someone said from a corner booth, most tables hadn't been converted yet to pews, uh, the bulk of our funds having been spent to paint the puke blue walls white. It's unsafe plus unpopular. 
The speaker, Ms. Bodislav, was, an ad, was my agitated psych teacher who seemed to hate our church yet attended every week. Someone with whom I noticed our fearless pastor never made eye contact. Let's just give it up. The 20 person congregation groaned in agreement, the noise echoing off the plastic order board still mounted to the walls. But Pastor Christine was adamant about staying open. She said the night spent on the floor of the vestibule had been humbling, that she'd heard God whistling through the whistle through the windows of her dreams. In fact, she wanted the drive through operational every night of the week. Yes, starting tomorrow. And were there any volunteers? Come on, people, she said, stomping. Communities don't make themselves. So I stood up. The congregants gasped. I needed community service hours in order to graduate. And yes, there was the fact that I hated people, almost everyone, especially the locals of Deliver, a place voted number three in Pennsylvania's top small towns to leave. I went to church mainly to get away from my family, to feel sullen before the epic grace of God, who I did not quite believe in, but had always secretly wished to reach, like the unbeatable boss at the end of an RPG. A popular school-wide joke went that I'd be nominated most likely to shoot the place up. But there was always a chance my there was also a chance my father, long ago a faithful member, might stop by to pray forgiveness, maybe lecture me about all the data I was using to watch porn on my smartphone. He'd left a month ago in the middle of an ugly fight with my mom where, to underscore a point, he put a pair of hedge clippers through our above ground pool, flooding the patio so bad the water dripped from the ceiling of my basement bedroom. Our church, though recently robbed, suffering from low attendance, inhabited by eccentrics and birds, made in an old Hardee's, was one of the more stable institutions in my life. Pastor Christine shook my hand hard and then called for a round of applause. That Monday, the pastor and I, or the pastor coached me through my first shift. She cut her hair off and looked a bit like Alice from Resident Evil, but with braces. Her hands shook, so she sat on them. Most people who stop by are just curious, offer basic info in the church, service times, dates for the barbecue, don't get bogged down in scripture and interpretation of rules. Don't debate the half-baked philosophy majors. Some people will wanna pray and that's what it's all about. Remember, focus on gratitude, not desire. And what about the people who wanna rob us? I said, she was silent, staring out at the dark, empty parking lot. Just give, she said, eventually, just give whatever they asked for. With my pastor beside me, I couldn't watch porn, so I passed the hours searching her Bible for its more cinematic moments. Floods, miracles, cities destroyed, but all I kept finding were the lists of names, the begetting and begotten. The only person to stop by that night was an old man who didn't know how to roll his window down and yelled through the glass that he wanted a roast beef and two Cokes, and one of those Cokes, goddammit, was a Dr. Pepper. I waved, I waved our brochure at him, I pantomimed prayer, he gave me the finger, and he left. Just think, Pierce, the pastor said, handing me a church key so I could let myself in the next night. This will make the perfect college admission essay. I think we both knew that I would never apply to college, but what neither of us knew was how I'd stagger into adulthood like a slow crash, burn for a decade, see my own death reflected in the eye of a wild ocean, and finally return to work as a custodian for the now thriving, expanded First Community Church of Deliver. By that time, housed in a converted bus depot with seating for 300 and no plastic booths crusted to hell with stuck gum. In fact, I'm glad neither of us saw this future, this future coming. His life should be lived in providence, not prophecy. At home that night, my mother was in my bedroom poking at the growing green spot in the corner of my ceiling. The pool water was seeping in and my room smelled like Clorox. You know what this means, she said, touching the swampy ceiling tile. Mom taught English lit in the next county over and lived by the metaphor of everything. I was tired, depressed about the roast beef and Dr. Pepper guy and just wanted to go to sleep. I looked out the window, checked the backyard for my father's truck. Mom, I think it means you guys were over chlorinating the pool. No, 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 she said. It's the void, love. It seeks us out. It always meets us exactly where we are. She went on as I fell asleep. Uh, the it she rambled on about sounding a lot like Pastor Christine's idea of God. Most of the next night's window shift, I spent bored on my phone, surfing porn, I'll admit, openly inviting God not to speak to me. 
I'd watched so many videos that I needed ones revolving around improbable and physical, physically uncomfortable scenarios. Like for example, there's an exercise ball between them or a housewife having knocked a fresh pie off a low window seal leans out the window and you get it. I like to imagine that after it was over, they'd eat the pie together in the kitchen, not bothering to pick the blades of grass or pieces of mulch out of the filling, just eating and smiling like naked, like it all made sense. But you know, I never got to the end. I'd been watching one of those videos when the night's first car pulled up to the window. You about bored? Miss Bodislav said, idling. She had a curly black ball of hair, sharp blue eyes, and a mole on her cheek that looked like a piece of cookie crisp. She taught psychology and economics, which was, for some reason, a single class. Maslow's hierarchy, it and the ego, the archetypes of dreams, this was her Monday, Wednesday, Friday. But Tuesday, Thursday was supply and demand inflation, a Wall Street simulation game called Mock Market. No matter what day of the week, when you walked into Mrs. Bodislav's room, Tracy Chapman's fast car blasted from her laptop speakers. Besides that, she was totally unpredictable, shouty and bitter in lectures, often late to class. Twice she'd canceled tests to show us her taped from TV copy of Sunday Bloody Sunday while she plucked nose hairs using her webcam as a mirror. She honked her car's weak horn at me. I'm fine, I said, sliding my phone under a Bible on the counter, an unsmooth move I used in her class often. It's pretty chill here, kind of meditative, you know, just sitting, looking out. Yeah, she said, at this beautiful parking lot, at that rusted fence over there, very tranquil. Nothing screams zen like broken beer bottles and no loitering signs. I laughed. Was this flirting? The closest I had come to flirting was giving this night elf all my rare swords in World of Warcraft. I learned, I leaned forward in my chair, my head a little out the window, and noticed her, eye, her eyes were bloodshot to shit. What, she said, you see some kind of devil in me? No, I, is Chris even there, she said. No, just me, I said. Pastor Christine is, you know, taking a hiatus from the drive through considering. If I ever find the motherfucker, Miss Bodislav said, but she looked disappointed. Her car, a junky sky-colored Camry from the early 90s, rattled harshly, the ceiling liner drooping onto her head. I heard the snap hiss of a can opening. Miss Bodislav brought a yingling to her lips and turned her stereo up. Tracy Chapman's low, smoky voice was unmistakable. You and I can both get jobs, finally see what it means to be living. She handed the can out of her window. I believe now that this night was the closest I had ever come to seeing God, but at 17, sitting in the drive through of my church, I just thought this weird woman was into me. I can't, I said about her offer of the beer, thinking of mom pumping my father's entire keg of lager down the tub the day he stabbed the pool and left. He, she, how she'd tossed the empty drum down the wooded hill of our backyard, how I'd counted the blackbirds that escaped into the sky, 21. Huh, Miss Bodislav said. Chris always trades sips when she prays with me. I reached through the open window and she put the can in my hand. The first sip tasted like wood. As I, learned, as I leaned out to hand it back, I took a long look around the parking lot for my father's truck. The place was empty. He was not coming. He was never coming. He would never be watching. I took another sip. What do you two pray about? I said. Oh, everything, my teacher said. Well, opposite things like Chris prays for her teeth to finally turn straight. And I pray she never takes those braces off because I love the way they cut up my tongue. And Chris prays the church will survive the, survive the downturn. And I pray she leaves her husband and I pray for more beer. And she prays for forgiveness for the ones we've emptied. You know, she prays for the world to disarm and join hands. And I pray for an explosion we can watch from the rear view on the interstate, the windows all down, hands clasped together on the gear shift. Am I getting too poetic? I pictured her face, taut and red in the grip of lecture. I thought of her and Pastor Christine together, their secret, sacred community of two. And I tried to act unsurprised and cool and detached like a man who wanders into a kitchen to find poetic, I said. In class, she said, do I come off like a hippie? Do I come off like a bitter hippie? You come off, I said, like psych and econ are just horrible games rich men play like golf. She opened the car door, planted her hands on the drive-through windowsill and said, 
that sir is the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. She hoisted herself up, bent at the waist and yelled man overboard as she tumbled face first into the church, kicking the shelf above the window. An old box of straws rained down onto our heads. I gave her space. I sat on the floor. For the rest of my second night at the drive through window, I watched Miss Bodislav command the drive through I took notes, drinking my half of every yingling. It seemed as if her presence brought, it seemed as if her very presence in that office chair brought people to us. We stayed open well past midnight. Eight cars came in total, and at one point there was a short line. But, you know, every person that pulled up, part of me just wanted them to leave. You know, what did we have to offer anyone? Miss Bodislav, on the other hand, never blinked. She stayed motivated. In the face of so much nothing, she chose to respond, her voice at times reaching that sweet spot, the zealous, happy shouting. It was an hours long communion. She said things like, if you want to split hairs, breathing is hope. To another person, she said, it's too easy. It's too boring not to have faith. If it's even a question, she said to an overworked older man, then you quit that fucking job. Without her there that night, I don't think I would have ever been able to look at a person and see through to their community. Community as an inherent object, like an invisible internal human organ, like a soul, but with arms reaching out. Beside her, I felt seen and grown, but not even a touch less afraid. Weeks later, my father would pull up to that my window and trembling, I'd convince him to cook the scrambled eggs for the annual pancake breakfast. I'd make him promise to use a little milk in the recipe. I remember he actually showed up and he brought his own walk. At two in the morning, Miss Bodislav puked on the floor. And before I ran off to find a mop, I thought of something, I thought I saw something in the yellow vomit. I convinced myself it was nothing, only what my mother always saw, the big vague void. When I came back with a stack of napkins, Miss Bodislav was gone, but the vomit was still there and the church was so filled with the odor of yeast, you could smell something growing. I looked again at the puke, at the image it was now undoubtedly making, a circle, a face, but blank, a clock with both hands stuck. The building's foundation was never level because the vomit was running, moving, though time was not. And I stepped out of the way as the clock morphed into a boat and it sailed and the hands of the clock broke into pieces. Now people on the deck, so many people waving as they left on the waves of a great flood. And I waved back until I saw that they were climbing the mast, until they were all crowded together in the crow's nest, until I saw that I was one of them. Thank you. That's really awesome, Tyler. Um, Thank you. Um, I, I think we'll start the conversation part of this now, if you're cool with that. Um, Absolutely. This is the first time I've ever really met Tyler. Uh, uh, so um, I was just going to say, in 2019, uh, Tyler sent me a, a really nice email about a book of mine that he liked. And um, I ended up uh, ordering his chat book, The Quiet Part Loud. And and those stories re really resonated with me and I really love them. Um, and so I was uh, really jazzed um, with this collection of stories when it came out. And I was really honored to get a chance to, to read those stories. Um, and in so many ways, they're just, um, they kind of encapsulate what I love about short fiction and, and uh, that there's absurdity and humor, but so much tenderness beneath that, so much tenderness for these characters who could so easily, I think, in lesser hands be characterized, you know, and, and that's just immediately struck me um, about your work. And so <clears throat> we talked a little bit of, about maybe what we might talk about, but, um, and, and I certainly encourage anybody that has a question for Tyler, I'll, I'll ask it as I see it come up. Um, and this was one of the stories I think I thought about in those questions I was asking you of, of a, you know, a church that's an old Hardee's of, of, of place. And, and one of the things I really love about your work is, is how, um, how place factors into the narratives. And especially because a lot of these landscapes seem like they seem broken on the surface, you know, like falling apart or places where people might want to leave, but they aren't. And so I wanted to think about um, 
what how and especially because um i know not all of these stories are set in pennsylvania but i wanted to think about how pennsylvania and that that region of pennsylvania kind of serves as an organizing principle for some of these stories like how it how it factors into the story as you tell it thanks yeah that that um is really astute and and kind thank you for uh, bringing that up the uh you know, places uh, interesting because I've often said before, and it is true to an extent that there's many stories, many of which are in this book that I've started and gotten well into before I woke up and realized that I don't know where it's taking place. You know, it'll be in a house, it'll be along a street, it might be near a river, but like I don't have an actual geographical location. And then sometimes kind of have to backwardly figure out like where it is and, and put some of those details in. Um, However, that's not the case for a lot of the stories that are set in Pennsylvania. So this story that I just read, Miss Vladislav's Vomit, is set in kind of what is, whenever I want to write about my hometown, uh, which is Dover, Pennsylvania, I mean, I'll let the cat out of the bag, Deliver is the is the, the name that I just used to stand in for it. And, you know, there was a Hardee's in my town and, and it went out of business. And like a lot of places, I'm just enamored by the way, I mean, enamored is the wrong word. It's kind of horrified, but also just interested in like when a, a building or a, a business becomes another place after it leaves. And like, that just didn't make any sense to me as a kid that it was like, wait, the Hardee's is now like a phone store? Like, how does that happen? Like, um, so it made me interested in the idea of like, what if one of those places had turned into a church? And actually, it, that was that happened a lot in the years that I was living in Lancaster. There were kind of churches popping up all over the place, like in the back of, like backside of strip malls, and like being held in like uh, comic book stores and like weird places. And I kind of thought that was cool, and I think that inspired it too. So what brings a, a lot of these stories together, I think, is with place is like I love a, a repurposed place, so a place that no longer is the thing it used to be, and now is being used for something completely different. And in some stories it's a um it's a racetrack that's now turned into like a demolition derby and which is also also as you read it morphing into a cult so um i yeah i love i love when things things change like that and there's a there's that happens a lot in these stories but uh, because it, it just shows that like everything is kind of liminal you know even if even the things that we consider to be institutions like you know, as a kid getting roast beef sandwich from Hardee's, that's an institution as much as a church. Like we used to do that with my dad, like go in the drive through and get roast beef after, uh, you know, hockey practice. And that was like a thing, but, and then it disappears and becomes something else. So it just is like early on teaching you the lesson that like nothing is kind of constant. Everything is always changing. So I think those types of things really uh, come out in my stories. And that has a lot to do with small towns, you know, I grew up in a very small town, uh, Dover, and I live in a pretty small town now. And when I was in grad school, it was a small, fairly small um, little city. And I'm just, yeah, that, that'll always be probably where I write about. I don't really understand bigger cities. I have nothing against them, but um, I'm just interested in these places that they seem really constant, but, you know, all these little pieces of them are always switching out. Uh, they're always changing. So I hope that touches on what you're no, yeah. And I mean, I think it's cool, too, because a lot of your stories have characters where maybe even if the place itself isn't being repurposed, like they're older. <laughs> right. And so they're contending with the fact that they've changed within that space and it feels repurposed in some ways. And yeah, yeah I loved all that stuff. And I th we were talking is that, you know, I grew up in a tiny town and, and I, I moved back. I still live in the same county where I grew up, mm. you know, and so I'm seeing those spaces change. But um the one time I lived out of Tennessee was in um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I worked there for two years and I'd always go to Maine and New Hampshire. And I was so struck by, I was like, this feels like the South to me. I drive through these small towns of New Hampshire. And I was like, this is Grundy County. I know it. And and it struck me that really what I connect to or what I feel communion with is, is rurality. You know, rurality. the isolation of living in a space where you may want something, but it's not there. And mm -hmm you can't really do anything other than make do. Um, right. And I love a lot of your stories have that sense. And there was that, what is in the, um, even in this story that you read, there's a line like, um, uh, focus on gratitude, not desire. And that yeah. feels like uh, 
rural life to me, you know, in yeah. so many ways. I thought it was really lovely. Um, yeah. And what you said just there before too made me think that maybe there's another metaphor to it, which is like these places are always changing. There's somehow it's like the same shell of a, a Hardy's, but now it's a church. That I guess that's similar to like the way we change as people like, uh, you know, the me five years ago barely even feels like the me today in some ways, but it's the same body and the same voice. And I look fairly the same though. I lost my hair recently. So, um, <laughs> so it's like, how am I, how is this still the same me, but like inside there's like all this different stuff going on, you know, I think we could all relate to that, but yeah, I feel like a Hardee's, um, you know, <laughs> that's been turned into some broken down thing. So yeah. Yeah. It, you know, in the chat, let us know which, um, which fast food place you feel like tonight. <laughs> so um, another question that I kept, um, there's so many of your stories in this collection um, kind of focus on the idea of work, um, sometimes the absurdity of it, sometimes the necessity of it. Um, and I like there was like a line that you say in it where it says um, part gratitude, part pain in the ass, you know, and it's hard for me when I read stories, uh, because this is what I did with my first collection too, where um, I love writing about the absurdity of work. And I think a lot of that came from reading a lot of George Saunders, you know, um, yeah. but your stories, I think, do some really interesting stuff with that. And I guess I'm wondering, like when you've talked a lot about the repurposing of spaces, um, uh, a lot of your characters, like, they have jobs, but there's always the possibility of like, if I lose this job, I'll lose the insurance or this job's a pain in the ass, but I have to have it. Or why don't you leave? So how, how does work like generate momentum in these narratives or how are they kind of hovering around your stories? Yeah, um, work is definitely a preoccupation of mine. In fact, I've my most recent project I finished is all is just a dozens and dozens of tiny little stories about people with absurd, different people with absurd jobs. It's something that I think about a lot. I think it's, uh, I do, I like that you brought up that quote too, because I, I feel that way about almost every job I've had, like incredibly lucky to have it, but there's, regardless of like how much the job may have seemed like really cool or like a dream in my mind, like once I'm there, there there's just some level of dread that's always there. And I don't know if that's just my anxiety or um, what it is, but dread seeps into all jobs for me, it seems. And it's not enough to like, for that I can't work, you know, I, I, but it's just like, there's always something about it. And I think it has a lot to do with just being kind of fed up with capitalism, especially with like the, the amount that you have to work just to have health insurance and things like that and how that that kind of stuff just you're just blind to as a younger uh, per, or you're just can't really see it all, excuse me, as a younger person. And, um, and then you grow up and you're like, wow, a lot of this just revolves on being able to have this health insurance card that uh, I can't even really use because the deductible is too high, but I'll work this job so that I can make sure that if I get hit by a car, I might be able to be okay. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like <laughs> kind of crazy, but every job I've had has inspired me a lot in way in wanting to write stories. Like I, there's a story in that chat book that you've read um, about watching cameras uh, for like the local safety coalition. And that was a job I had. And it was a surreal job. Every moment of it was surreal. It was like at once surreal and, and completely boring. Like I've never been more bored at a job in my life, but it was also like, I was, monitoring 120 130 different cameras all around the city to like basically just I wasn't even it was basically just like monitoring the cameras and then uh, being on call in case the police called to be like hey there's something happening here can you like focus on it and like that happened like three or four times where I had to like use a camera to like watch something happen I mean it was it was kind of like a, a twisted job but um so anyway I don't really know I'm kind of rambling about this but work work is like it's a huge part of everyone's life I mean again I'm uh, coming from a small town I don't come from a lot of money and everyone that everyone in my family has had to work their entire lives and will probably work for a very long time and it's just um that's you just can't not write about that uh, I do remember 
the very cliche thing of at one point turning in a story for a workshop it, very early in my grad school years and someone being like, what is this character's job? You know, one of those like questions that just cuts really right to the core that you have no idea what you're doing. And I was like, oh shit, I need to know what their job is. And then I think maybe that may have influenced, like, then I wrote about, I almost started just writing about jobs straight out like that. It almost inspired me then to be like, let's write about jobs. And your story that's from tunneling in the center of the earth about the person who works at the Scrabble factory, oh, like yeah. uh, making the tiles. I mean, I can't say how influential that was because going, going past the dread and boredom of work to like a level of absurdity really is exciting and has opened up so many things for me. I think that's evident in the book for sure. Oh, that's lovely. I yeah. think about Saunders a lot too, where it's like, to the to to anyone that doesn't do the job so much of work is absurd and it's right. interesting how quickly we internalize that absurdity and it just becomes the thing that you do you know uh and you just stop questioning it because what else are you going to do but do the work and and i think you do a, like even in the story about the, the demolition derby that turns into a cult like the way once you're in it you kind of accept almost anything on some level because what else are you going to do I, right. I think it's really wonderful um i do want to get there is a question from the audience that it says the stories in this collection are so wonderfully layered subplots and main plots working together seamlessly uh, is this something you were conscious of when writing or does this layering happen naturally hmm. that's, from that's a great question and it's quite flattering because i um i all the time think that that's a weakness of my writing actually like I'm always worried that there's not enough going on plot wise or that if there are more characters than just maybe the main character and the object of their desire or the or or whoever the main character is closest to if there's other ancillary characters I often feel like I'm not doing enough with them to like make them real and make them have a goal and a desire but um you know I, I'm often one of the worst <laughs> uh, critics of my own writing, so maybe I am doing that okay. It's definitely something I've become aware of, and in recent years especially, I love, um, uh, oh man, I'm going to forget the name of it now, but there's a television show that I'm always blown away by how every, uh, like every, even the smallest character, they have a mission that they're on, and they're, man, uh, of course, this is a bad example. Anyway, um, yeah, I want I want small characters in stories to like, even if it's uh, even if it's not super important to the rest of the story, I want them to be on a mission of their own in a way, even if it's something as their mission is to make their job less boring. Like I'm thinking of the uh, clerk who runs the quick trip in, in a story called The Idler, like uh, is clearly just bored and wants to like he wants to make friends while he's at work. And it's like, that is, that's a goal that that's a mission he's on. But uh, I appreciate that about the, the layers to the stories. I, um, I love fiction that does that. I love fiction that it's got uh, subplots and, and multiple plots going. I mean, one of the biggest influences to me as a writer in general is the show Seinfeld. And in Seinfeld, there's <laughs> always at least three plots going on and, the, and then they start to intersect. I would love to be able to write with that much economy of plot um I, I'm definitely less less of a plot person but uh I guess it comes through in some ways hopefully or at least for one person but <laughs> thanks love that Seinfeld is I'm older than you I know but uh this that was that was everything for me that show I feel like yeah. I learned so much about like humor narrative character from that show and it was also lovely because it was it was it was what I imagined New York was. It was my, my living in Winchester, Tennessee. I was like, oh yeah, of course, everything is better there. But um, yeah, and they I, all I get also, to, they get to each other's houses so quickly, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. And this, I think, when with that question, which I really loved, and like, is this layering like natural? Does it come naturally, or is it conscious? Is one of the things like in the questions that I asked you, I was interested in a previous interview I read of yours where you said like place really comes into it at the tail end of the story, you know? And so we started to talk and you said that like, um, I was really interested in it. You said, um, I usually, uh, my approach is more like poets maybe in that I often with most of these stories begin with a first line I just love for its humor, music and specificity and then tried to keep writing sentences and questions would come out, you know, characters would come out of those questions. And it said, it's very ungraceful, unliterary. And I, I feel that said that I think one of the like things I love about fiction is 
that that we don't talk about enough is just how much of it is instinctual you yeah. know like you want to tell students about like craft like character and plot but like honestly like such a weird thing to be like I need a good character to start this story I mean it's it's all instinct and then you figure out that craft and so I wanted to ask you about that those first lines which are really wonderful um how does how does that function for you then yeah um I I have just I think all writers have this folder on their desktop or folder in their files that's abandoned stories and mine is uh gargantuan I really can't stress enough how many abandoned stories there are and it's because my favorite way to write a story and it's just it has the least chance of ever being successful but some, sometimes when it when it works it is does feel magical is to start with a sentence that is uh written in the note and a note on my phone called um usually it's the note that's called poetry it's like a sentence that writ is written in that there and I pull it out and I'm like if this is the first sentence of a story, what would have to happen to make this sentence work? Because, you know, I am a sucker for first sentences and I always, I'll pick up a book of stories and I'll flip through and read first sentences and see what hooks me. I really, um, I really need that first sentence to be something that startles me and definitely brings me right into the story. I needed to kind of slap me in the face a little bit. And so I have a you know, a ton and ton of stories that have really great first sentences, but it's so hard to just be like, I'm going to write a story to try to make this sentence uh, believable and make this sentence work. But uh, this, the story I read tonight is a great example of that. I just thought uh, our, our church had a drive through window is a great sentence. And I'm like, okay, so how does that, what do I have to do to make that, to make that true? And sometimes that's why I write stories that are 300 words long in the book. And sometimes that's why stories have to go on for 20 pages to find everything that needs to be true in order to make that first sentence true, you know? Um, but yeah, I'm just, a, I'm a sucker for, uh, for music and, and uh, rhythm of sentences and just great sentences. And I read, I think as much poetry as I, as I read fiction. And I hope, you know, that comes through sometimes. I think it, it may frustrate some readers who are, <laughs> read more who read more fiction, uh, and but uh, I do. It's it's just who I am. I really I really need the the language to have music to it, and um, yeah, I'll 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 spend months hitting, banging my head on the wall to try to make a story work because I just don't want to let go of this great sentence. You know, of course I I've written stories other ways, but you know a lot of this book is written that way. I'd say. That's really interesting to me. It makes me think a lot. I don't want to talk too much, but like it makes me think a lot about Gordon Lish and that idea of like consecution and swerve, you know, where the first line, the second line has got to like speak to, but also do violence to the line that came before it. Mm. And that momentum and rhythm. I loved when I heard you talk about that because I, I can feel that in the stories that that you write, that that sense of like the line begets the line, but with a little more verve and swerve to keep that momentum going. And I, I just think it's really lovely and wonderful. And yeah. and then it, and and then there's a moment where um, it starts to hone in on what the story is at the heart of it, you know, and the characters come up. But yeah, I always love the way your stories build and begin. Yeah, thanks. I, it reminds me too when you say that about how the. I haven't heard that Gordon Lish thing, but that sounds like something I should read about because uh, it sounds really engaging. But it reminds me like the first story of the book like is um, uh, starts with uh, Luther buys cars, which is just a sentence that was written on a billboard in Minnesota that I saw. And then I almost got to the point where I was like, I wrote Luther buys cars and I was like, my instinct often to to make that first sentence true, like I keep saying, like to make that sentence work is like, I have to in the next sentence like uh make it hyperbolic and make it even bigger like not only does he buy cars he buys everyone's cars he bought your car he bought your mom's car like uh and then the story kind of builds from that it, that momentum really helps and then the character comes out of that that voice like who's who's saying who would say this who would speak this way and then it, it's the layer the levels and levels of revision and revision and revision to get the uh to get really deep into the heart of the story and not have it just be kind of um, funny and entertaining, which I love to be, but uh, I hope that all the stories are, show the evidence that the work is done to to figure out what's deeper than just just entertainment. Um, yeah, so so I'm not sure how much 
time we have left. Um, do you know, Tyler? Looks like, like four minutes, but you know, if this is a good well, stopping place, I think no one look, would. Can I ask you one more question though? Cause I just, um, mm -hmm. I, I really love short fiction and it's the thing I think that first made me want to write was the, I, you know, in, in, in college, two of the books that came out when I was in college were Saunders Civil War Land and Bad Decline and Amy Bender's Girl in a Flammable Skirt. And yes. for whatever, I think it's just youth and nostalgia, but those two collections are burned in my brain. And I still think my style in so many ways is just trying to rewrite those two collections, you know? Sure. And so I wondered for you in, in reading these stories and thinking about them as a collection, what, um, what are story collections that you feel like were foundational for you? You know, that like, um, yeah. that you keep coming back to as a sense of like, this is what I'm kind of building off of. For sure. I'm glad you brought that up. I love to talk about story collections. They're my first love as well. The first story collection I fell in love with and really did make me want to be a writer um, was a book called Miguel Street by V.S. Naipaul. Um, I don't know that, I don't see it talked about a whole lot. And I know that there's, I think there's some issues with V.S. Naipaul's behavior, but um I read a, one of his stories in high school for like a, an English test. It was B. Wordsworth, and it's from that collection, Miguel Street. It's a connected collection of all these stories that are set on the same street, and um, all the characters kind of know each other, but they each have their own story, and they sometimes crisscross, and there, there's a central narrator who's kind of bringing them all together, but that book just blew my mind, and I've recommended it to many friends over the years and have returned to it a lot of times, but in, in recent years, um, I gotta say, uh, Justin Torres is uh, We the Animals. I read that in grad school and that really made me dig deeper into a, a, a short story. You know, it's gotta be, it's gotta have some humor to it. It's gotta be musical and have rhythm and just sound good on the page. It's gotta sound good if it was read out loud, but it's also gotta be really truthful and get to the heart of what's happening and not hold anything back and that's that collection taught me that for sure plus the fact that the chapters are flash i mean it is a novel it's not he would probably object to me call, talking about it like a, a short story collection but uh I, that's how i think of it and then yeah i'm a huge devo devotee of saunders as well and um uh um the other thing i want to point i would want to point to is Lori moore amy hempel mary robeson uh, they're kind of like all in this club together for me of like just the funniest, the funniest writers that I know and who also write in gorgeous sentences. So to be funny and understandable and have such uh, a poetry in their writing, I go back to Birds in America a lot. I go back to the collected Amy Hempel stories and Mary Robeson's um, collection Tell Me, which is where I got the epigraph for my book. Uh, I love Robeson so much. Yeah. Um, She's wild. We'll, maybe we can close with this question from Aaron Birch. Uh, yeah. Um, it's just, uh, and I just, again, Tyler, I'm so, so grateful that you'd let me be a part of this and to celebrate your book. And wow, and, I'm so grateful you're for here. everyone that came. It's, it's really lovely. And um, Aaron just said, you know, talking about absurdity and, and humor and, um, I uh, feel like humor uh, can be so hard in fiction. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about writing the humor in short stories. Do you have a sense of that? Yeah, um, I think that for me, humor just comes from finding specific details. I think that always with um, with stand-up comedy, which I, I loved a lot as a teenager, I still like some stand-up for sure, but uh, I was always just, I loved the way not really like what a punchline was, but the way uh, a, co a comic just bringing up a series of details that painted such a clear picture of a person by the three details they used to talk about them. I love that kind of thing. So uh, for me, I'm always just looking for the awkward, but like recognizable detail that someone else is going to be like, oh yes, I can't believe somebody else noticed that. It's so funny to me when I read a book and someone brings up a detail that either about a person or about a place that is so specific. And I'm like, I've noticed that. I've even probably written in my phone, like this deep, I wish I could come up with a great example right now. I'm thinking a lot lately about how the, the icicles uh, hang off the roofs here. Like, you know, 
like skeleton hands or like finger, like witchy fingers. And so like something like that, when I see another writer bring that detail up, that will make me laugh. And to me, that's enough of a joke than, than to write a, a, a setup and a punchline. You know, I, I admire comedians and, and writers who can write kind of setup and punchline. I'm not sure I really write that way. And often if I do see myself trying to write dialogue or a scene around to, to make someone get off a really good joke, it's usually already doomed from the start. So, so yeah, I just stick to trying to follow details to find humor and the way people talk. I am, uh, I'm enamored by the way people, the way, uh, just the things people say and the kind of um, colloquialisms and the tone of voice when people speak to each other, that makes me laugh more than, more than anything. So I hope that gets to it. And thanks That's for great. asking that, Aaron. Yeah, I think we're, I think we've hit the end of our time here, but uh, thank awesome. you to everybody. Yeah, thank you. And thank Dan, thanks Dan and writers and books for putting this on. This is really great. You guys have been supportive of Aaron and I for years and uh, this means a lot. So thanks. Well, thank you for being here. That was, that was great. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to Kevin. Uh, buy the books, uh, the links in the chat. Uh, I want to take an opportunity to thank our funders. There they are. Um, this, uh, this reading, as all of our readings, will be posted on YouTube, so you can watch it again. Uh, and I want to say thank you and have a great night. Thank you all. Take care.